Welcome into another podcast for Gym Sport Go. This time I'm joined by the one and only Grant Fox, of course, an All Black selector, but much more to his career than just selecting the All Blacks team. We'll get to that very soon. Foxy, thanks so much for your time, mate. How are you coping in this isolation? Well, you've got to cope, don't you? I mean, we can't control this. Well, we can by doing what we're doing, I guess, what we're being asked to do, and hopefully we can get control of it. But we just locked up at home, still very busy at work on the phone, but the garden's getting a good um, seeing too, so it's um, going to look the best it's ever looked. I'm just looking out the window at it, actually, looking at other stuff I've got to do. I've got, we've got an acre of land, and it's quite a mature garden, so there's lots of stuff that grows, but yeah, we're making progress. Yeah, that's right. I think everyone's got real well mown lawns at the moment. Hey, mate. It could be a remarkable year. Uh, let's hope it's not like this, but it could be a year where we never see the All Blacks play. Well, that's possible, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't want to speculate on anything because there are people much smarter than me in the in the right positions who are going to figure all that out. But you know, I guess that de- you know that will depend on when we come out of lockdown, when other countries come out of lockdown. You know, whether whether international. Um, uh, travels possible, all of those things. So, as I said, people much smarter than me and positions of influence are going to figure all that out, and I've got faith in them. But I guess it'll be what it'll be, won't it? Um, you know, we, who knows? We could be playing some rugby in the summer months. Yeah, we could well be. We could well be. What have you guys uh, been up to as selectors? Have you been able to do much at all? Uh, look, we, we were making good progress, and you know, just, just a watching brief, you know, uh, to be honest, we'd had a couple of a sort of deep dives. And, and with a wide group that we, we were looking at, and then this hit, and and, um, and you know um, Plum's the new boy on the block, so he's itching, he's itching to get into it and pick a team. So um, um, you know we're just, I mean we're still having hookups, um, not from a selection point of view, but the wider All Black management group, um, you know, going through everything that's on the table, including you know what what we're dealing with. Um, and, you know, we have at the moment and formally organised, not sure what time yet, but Fozzie and uh, Plum and I will have a bit of a hook-up next week and, and and have a bit of a chat about, you know, what it would look like if we were picking a team subject to everyone being fit and available. So we'll make that assumption and then um, work through injuries. And it's just an exercise to keep a hand in, really, because um, we don't know, you know, how we're going to come out of this. The players, obviously, it's difficult for them. They're at home, but, you know, they're all being looked after by their franchises and, 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 and us to some degree as well. So you just got to trust them to get on with it. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the update there. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to chat to you was to have a bit of a trawl back through your career, mate. Uh, and I know that there's a strong Lions, British and Irish Lions link through your career because as a young fella on your farm back in Matamata, you were kicking... A toe hacks, weren't you? And then the Lions came along and someone showed you a different way to kick the ball that maybe wasn't so painful. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so that was way back in 1971. The British Lions were here and I was brought up on a farm in the Waikato, a 300 acre sheep farm that diversified a little bit into, into beef at the time. So um, my father was a rugby player, played fullback. He was a torpedo style goal, goal kicker. So, you know, the flat toe hack. So that's what I used to do as a youngster. In 71, I was seven. Um, sorry, I was nine, I should say, and, and, and um, vividly, you know, having a very toe um, from trying to toe hack a size four rugby ball, or four and a half it might have been, um, you know, in the winter and the, in the cold, frosty conditions. And I saw this guy called Barry John kicking around the corner. He was quite good. And my, <laughs> my, my first impression was, see, that'll actually, it won't hurt my toe anymore. I yeah. guess that, that little bone on my instep, I'll kick it with it. So that's, that's actually where I got the idea of um, kicking around the corner. Yeah, that's good. That's right. And then, as a player, obviously, you got to play against them a fair few times. Well, what was your first? What's your first memory as as a player against the British Lions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as a player, it was it was Auckland in nineteen eighty three? Um, yes. we, we had a midweek game. I can't remember whether it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday. I'm pretty sure it was a midweek game actually, and 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 in pretty miserable conditions at Eden Park. Um, we won, what was it? You'll tell me, 11 10, was it? Was that the score in the end? You always say, right? me. you always say, you got to check 12, the text, Jim. 12, 10. But you're 100 12, 10. correct. Oh, okay. Or well, whatever it was, but, and I dropped the goal. We were a point behind and had a pretty handy position. I dropped, kicked the goal. And, and you know, and that was nice that the team could win. In fact, it was, the, it may well have been the start of Auckland going through a whole decade playing international teams without actually ever losing. Um, which is a record that um, um, I'm very proud to be part of. But 
my opposition that day was Ollie Campbell, the great Irish 5'8". Hell of a good man, Ollie. And he gave us a... I had a, a lasting memory from that game was, was, yeah, we won, but it was actually playing against this guy who, who just knew, knew how to push people, push the team around the park. Ollie was a master, tactically, in those conditions, how he kept the ball, you know, um, you know, on width on the sideline or in front of his pack, just controlling field position. We struggled for field position all day. He just kept driving us back, kept choosing right options. It left a, a hell of a lasting impression on me about, you know, what I needed to do if I wanted to play the game, you know, at, at that level. And, you know, he sought me out after the game. We had a beer together. That's not unusual for the Irish, obviously. But um, <laughs> we just, you know, he came and, you know, he was a guy I admired immensely and he took his time to come and seek me out and have a chat. So, you know, I've got a great memory from that day, but not so much what people think about the drop goal, although that was a memory, but it was more about, in many ways, more about Ollie Gamble for me. Nice. And then, mate, in 1993, when the Lions came back, obviously, 10 years later, you were sort of at a junction of your career, but a bit before that, where you were thinking, yeah, I might give the game away after the 90 World World Cup. And the Lions kind of, they kind of saved your career in that regard, didn't they? Well, I mean, 91 wasn't a good time for a few of us, obviously. And, um, you know, we were, we were copping it. And, and I'll, be, I'll be brutally honest with you, that was hard, that was hard to take. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it's um, you know, when, you, when you're in the spotlight like that and um, you've got a, a four-year-old son at the time who said, what's daddy done wrong? You, it is a bit over the top. Um, but I took some time out uh, at the end of the, that year. Wasn't sure if I was going to play again um, in 92. But with a bit of a break, and um, and, a, and sort of rebuilt my desire to play and, and thought that, you know, I still love the game. I'm not caring what people were saying. I still want to give this a shot. It's what I love. I love doing it. So I worked hard and, um, you know, got back into it. Um, um, you know, was lucky enough, I guess, in a way to get picked on the Tour to Australia in 92 and, and you know, eventually worked into some form. Um, and, and then, the, um, but part of the driving factor, and I sort of stepped a little bit far ahead, was that, I didn't really think I had four years in me, um, but I probably had a couple. And the Lions in 93 were a driving force because I'd never played them against them as an all-black and I really wanted to do that. So I thought I could maybe eat another two years. I was, you know, 29 to 31, I didn't think was too big a step. Mm. Um, and then for me, you know, that time to step away after that was, you know, it was time, right, the timing was right for the all-blacks in my view. Um, because they needed time to find somebody else, um, give them, you know, a good two years. I might not have been good enough. And, in uh, 95 anyway, but then this fella called Mertens came along and he turned out pretty useful too. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I got another couple of years and a crack at the Lions and won a series. And then, you know, the All Blacks, you know, um, did very well with Mertz at the helm. And, you know, we all know what happened in 95. They were, they were a bit unlucky, but um, they played yeah. some great footy. I think in 93 also, uh, Grant, didn't you achieve something quite unique in that you played the Lions four consecutive Saturdays because Auckland played them in between one oh, of the two. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Actually, you're right. Yeah, we did. My can't remember, when was Auckland? Um, after, the, no, after the first test, wasn't it? I think. I can't remember, to be honest. But yeah, we played them. It was four consecutive Saturdays. Um, and that Auckland side in that, that era was, was chockload of All Blacks too. So um, uh, we, had a, we had a win that day as well. So that was another win for Auckland over an international team. Um, but obviously we lost the second test in Wellington against the Lions comfortably enough. That was 197, I think, which in those days was a bit of a hiding. And then we bounced back pretty well in Eden Park in the, at Eden Park in the last test. And then, mate, uh, just to continue on the Lions theme, I know that after the 2015 World Cup, you were prepared to step away. You were ready to step away as an All Black selector. Uh, but again, it was the Lions that kind of, in a way, convinced you to hang around and do a couple more years. Um, I don't think, I mean, God, that's a long, it's a long time ago for me even now, Jim. I, look, I don't think I was going to step away then, to be perfectly honest. It was after the Lions series that, that I was thinking of stepping away. Um, I mean, after 2015, um, yeah, we were very happy with what we achieved, but I don't recall having any real thoughts about um, wanting to step away. But obviously, you know, the motivation to go for another couple of years with a Lions series to be involved in a different capacity um, was motivating. Um, you know, I was still um, wanted by by Steve, which was nice. Um, and so we got through to 2017. It was after 2017 that I was reasonably keen to step away, but Steve wasn't very keen for me to do that, which I, once again was, you know, flattering. And he's a very convincing man, Mr. Henson, you know that. He's bloody hard to say no to. So anyway, 
<laughs> he certainly is. He certainly is. What is it about um, being a selector? What is it that you like? What's, what's sort of the motivation and the driver for you as being a, a selector of the All Blacks? I love this team. Um, you know, I, I am deeply passionate about I'm deeply passionate about New Zealand rugby. Um, it's an, I mean, this is a you know, trite and cliched, but it's true. It, it, it's an honour and a privilege to do this. Um, it really is. You know, to, to, to be part of a side that's, um, um, you know, very dear to my heart, um, that has is, is got this great record. Um, it's got uh, it's a great environment to be part of, um, um, that you get the chance to see, you know, the, the, go around the country, um, uh, you know, look at ga- watch games, look at talent. Uh, you know, um, f- you know, for a game and a team you're very passionate about is just it's very special. Um, um, and I mean, I love you know doing that. Then I love the nitty gritty of the debate. You know, we got to narrow it down. We're always talking about lots of people. Then you got to narrow it down, and it's always tough when you know you got to leave really talented players out. But that's you know the nature of what we've signed up for. Um, and then, you know, once my job, uh, you know, my job is done in helping select that group, which is my bigger role than selecting the group. When it gets down to, you know, team by team, yes, I'm still involved, but I guess the bigger job is picking the bigger group. Um, and then just watch it go out and perform, you know, and you don't always get what you want. We know that from a, a recent tournament, um, you know, a little bit further north from here. But um, often we got what we wanted, which was good performances, which, you know, in turn led to victories. And um, it was just it'd be great to be part of a team that's very, um, and I'm going to shut up in a minute so you can ask the next question, Jim, but it, it, this team is very big on on um, trying to enhance the All Black legacy. Um, and it's a big driving force that we're just guardians of the jersey. We just put it on and we pass through it and we hand it over to someone else. And that's from a that's from a playing perspective. And so they're very keen to leave, leave their own mark and, and try and enhance the jersey as they pass through it. And it's great to be part of something like that. You had huge success uh, after the 2015 World Cup, despite losing so many wonderful players, you know, Nonu McCaw, Carter, Smith, uh, Milamu, just to, just to name a few, I probably left one or two out. Um, what is the challenge there? And what's the challenge, I guess, now? Because, again, you've lost some wonderful players too. How, how tough is it, I guess, to not... Because rebuilding is the wrong word for the All Blacks, but to, to continue the success. Yeah, well, re-establishing is the word we use after 2015. And, I mean... The, 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 you know, the process now is no different than it was, you know, in 2015. I mean, we planned for losing a whole lot of players. Um, you know, and, and the guys you named and even the ones you missed, we, we knew they'd be going. They weren't going to carry on. So we picked some guys early in that cycle, you know, that, that were part of the group all the way through and kept developing without going into a whole lot of names. Sam Kane was one, a classic example, you know, and look, look, at, look where Sammy is now. Um, and what a feature he's been for the All Blacks since 2015. So, um, and and that process was, you know, a little bit part of our thinking still um, for um, the 2019 World Cup. Yes, we didn't get the outcome we wanted, um, and but we still knew we were going to lose some people, and we had to, we had to make sure we had, you know, as much as possible people in the wings ready to go. And you're not going to have everybody, you know, you're still going to have to trust. Uh, and rely on the talent we've got that's going to put its hand up and demand to be selected anyway, even if they haven't had a crack in the jumper beforehand. That was the same, and uh, you know, post twenty fifteen, it's going to be it's going to be the same this time round. We're going to see rugby change. The structure of rugby is going to change because of this COVID crisis. We we know that it's pretty much been accepted. You played in a fantastic time when there were tours and all of those sorts of things. All that we look back on it with a little bit, a little bit of nostalgia. Can you see Foxy Rugby going back that way at all? Who knows? Um, look, at the moment, I would say for the next period of time, all bets are off, aren't they? I mean, when, you know, when we get out of this, there will be a win. It's just, you know, um, uh, you know it's, it's not if we'll get out of it. We will. It's a matter of when we'll get out of it. Mm. You know, it's not going to look the same for a while, is it? We're all going to be scrambling to, to get the game going and play, um, you know, just for the love of the game, but also, whether we like it or not, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a considerable business. And we all, you know, we all that well now know the struggles New Zealand rugby are having through this process and they're going to have to rebuild and you've got to get the, you know, the, the commercial part of the game open again. Um, and, the playing, and the playing part of it's obviously the critical part of that. So what it looks like, and I think it'll return to normality, you know, uh, you know there'll be maybe some permanent changes, but I still think there'll be a lot of what we've had 
once we get back to normal. That could take 80 months, two years. Who knows? I don't know. But could even be next year. Who knows? But um, whether we go back to tours, you know, difficult. In, in an interim, maybe. There could be a little of that. I don't know. Um, longer term, you know, once the competitions get up and running, it's still going to be just as difficult to fit those tour, you know, those, those old-fashioned tours in again, just as it has been in recent years. So, you know, um, I mean, don't forget there are, you know, um, privately owned footy clubs that want to get back and established. Um, you know, they'll want their competitions up and running. So there may not be too many gaps to have old-fashioned tours again, but maybe in the interim there could be the odd, you know, um, game organised as teams try and get back, you know, if you can travel internationally into, into a touring mode to help, you know, play the game. And in turn, that helps generate revenue for the game. What was your favourite tour, mate? When you went away uh, in your career, what was your favourite tour that you went on? Look, um, I'm going to name two here for different reasons. Um, um, South Africa in 92, because they are the old folk. Right, yeah. they really are, and we know our history. I don't need to dive into that. We all, you know, we all understand that. I think, um, and so to have them back in the fold and be, you know, over there with Australia at the same time was was pretty special. It was a dream come true for me to do that. Yeah. Um, the country I loved touring the most, just you know, on and off the field, was France. I yeah. just they have this great passion for the All Blacks. That's actually. It's a bit, I mean, it's humbling. A bit scary, to be honest, the pedestal they put you on. But I just, I love the French attitude to life. You know, um, um, the, the great flair for the game. Um, love the history of the country. Um, you know, the people were so hospitable, especially when they found out you weren't English and you were from New Zealand. You were okay. You were okay. But, you know, um, but there's centuries of history um, between the French and the English. So, um well, there's nothing new in that, but um, yeah, I just I just loved and look, I think I played well in France too, and that always probably you know, particularly in 1990. So that always sort of yeah, I guess sort of leads you a little bit to enjoy something a little bit more. But um, yeah, you know, I just I just loved it—the culture, the attitude, the history, the food. It was great. 1989 was also obviously a big tour and one that came into our homes because of that uh, that that video that they put together, the the good, the bad, and the and the rugby. What about that game, uh, and I can't remember who it was against, but you'll know it well, where you played into, into a hurricane wind. And at the end of it, I remember Keith Quinn saying that the, the commentary tower fell over just when he climbed down and walked away. And in the second half, you and Joe Stanley, basically you just kept giving the ball to Joe and Joe kept crashing it into the forwards. It was such a strong wind. Yeah, that was against the Nestle at Stratty Park. I mean, you know the old Max Boyce song. I still think the score was up at 9-3. Um, with, with the nephew winning, so that that old fable is true, I think. But um, it was like it was a hurricane. It was like the winds were, you know, I don't know, I don't know, up to 100 kilometres an hour or whatever. I mean, it was fair howling. They closed one of the grandstands. There wasn't a hell of a lot of people there. We played um, downwind um, in the first half, and we were up 11-0. And I mean, playing down was. You couldn't even pass the ball. It was going so far forward. You kick it, it would go dead, which you could do in those days. And so that was obviously part of the strategy. And we sort of turned uh, 11 nil up into the wind. And um, I know the opposition thought that they had a good show of winning. But it actually was easy to play into the wind. Um, but it was, a, you know, and the score still finished 11 nil. It might have been 11 3, I can't remember. But I mean, all you'd do is you'd grind away. You couldn't, you know, you, up one touch on, you could try and kick it out. And I used to put the ball plate, you could place kick it out in those days. There was a little bit of that going on. On one side of the field, it was bloody pointless because it was really exposed. Yeah. And, and I, was either, I think Walter was playing second 5-8. I think so. It might have been Bernie, but I think it was Walter. Um, and, I mean, he and Joe had turns of taking the ball up because that's all you could do. Hold it, you know, bash away, pick and go, close to the ruck, you know, have another bash again. And at one stage, I felt sorry for them. So I had to go myself at cutting it up. It was sort of <laughs> Joe looking at me and saying, what's all, mate? Bloody hell. Um, but, yeah, You'd grind your way 50, 60, 70 metres up, but then you lose the bloody ball, they'd kick it down to it and you'd start again. It was a whole lot of body. I've never played in conditions like it. It was absolutely bizarre. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was certainly some experience and one I've not forgotten. Yeah. Hey, mate, you talked about uh, Ollie before. Who, who were the first fives that gave you the most trouble in your career? Well, the one I played against the most was Michael Liner. Um, yeah. Tremendous yeah. respect for Michael. A hell of a good player. Um, um, so, you know, he could navigate, goal kick, um, 
uh, you know, he was he wasn't a big guy, Michael, but he's more solidly built than me. So he was reasonably abrasive to defend against. So everyone knows how much trouble I had in that phase of the game. Um, <laughs> but I, I played against him him an awful lot. Um, um, I'm just trying to think who else in, in particular. I mean, I got um, Frank Manello played a bit against from France, and I've uh, got great respect for Frank. Um, played against Nas once. You know, I remember Nas here in 1981 where we played against him in 92 Nas Porter so it was only the once um, against Nas in an all black jersey but um, you know he was um, you know he was a dominant force yeah. Uh, but yeah the guy who played the most who had a great all round game that I had tremendous respect for on and off the field you know, was Michael and mate you played with some wonderful players the likes of uh, Sir John Kerr and Joe Stanley a big favourite of mine uh, Sir Michael Jones who, who would you sort of regard as perhaps, I know it's a hard one, but the greatest player that you've played alongside? Oh, these are horrible questions to answer, Jimmy. Um, look, um, um, I, don't, I don't look, great, names you mentioned, great players, and, and you know, very, very good friends of mine still, and a lot of guys from that era have got great affinity. Um, I, I mean, I mean, J.K. I'm going to I'm going to talk about two players. I'm not going to categorise them in terms of one or two, but but you know who the best was. Um, but but I mean, J.K. was was one of the first really big wingers, wasn't he? Who had who had size, um, pace, um, a step, a fend, um, an offload in the tackle. Um, he used to think he could kick too, but he couldn't. Um, <laughs> um, um, and mate, I'll never forget that try scored against Italy in, in um, 1987. That was yeah. one of the enduring memories I have. And the other guy who trailed him in that try was Michael Jones. Mm. And Michael, Michael was an, an, a, just a very special talent. Um, um, and, and the way I'd categorise Michael, I reckon he was such a good footballer. If you said to Michael, you're going to play centre in a test match in a month, and you're going to get a couple of games beforehand and, and uh, lower levels of the game and you're going to train there, I reckon he could have played the position bloody well. I reckon that's how good he was. Mm. Um, you know, an incredible special talent, very special man. Um, and look, both those men have got knighthoods. Um, and rugby is only a small part of that. Their contribution in other spheres of New Zealand society is enormous, and that's what they're more recognised for, their knighthoods. But, you know, they've been, they've been great givers, haven't they? Um, not only to rugby, but to our nation. And uh, they're very special men. They certainly are, mate. They certainly are. Hey, Foxy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, uh, try and cope with isolation and take it easy on the lawns and the garden, eh? <laughs> All right, Jimmy. Good to chat, mate.